there, everybody. Welcome to the 98.2, the Kelly Cardenas podcast, where attitude is everything. Today's guest uh, is so much fun. Uh, this, I want to ask you a question first for all of you guys out there listening. I want to read from my notes because I need to hold on to this. What is Anne Hathaway, Claire Danes, Mila Kunis, Jennifer Aniston, Zoe Deschanel, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name, Heidi Klum, Nicole Richie, Kristen Stewart, Scarlett Johansson, Black uh, Widow, Kira Knightley, Emma Roberts, Gwen Stefani, Amy Adams, Demi Moore, Victoria Beckham, Selena Gomez, and the, the, the J. Lo, Smartwater, Avino, Macy's, L'Oreal, New Balance, Jessica Simpson Lifestyle, Beckham uh, Signature Fragrance, Emporio Armani, Guest, Pantene, Estee Lauder, Creative Nail, and Chanel all have in common. You guessed it, my next guest, Mr. Tom Bachik. This guy is incredible. I met him at the Behind the Chair, uh, behind the chair uh, Hair Show in, in San Antonio, and I was blown away, not only by his accomplishments. I mean, when, when I heard that, I was like, wow, this guy is amazing. But he stood out to me because of his humble spirit that just he he wasn't talking about hey beating his chest i am this guy he was just there and talking about he was a regular dude he was a regular dude and he talked about some great things that on how all of us can look at differently at our life and how his attitude changed everything so welcome to the show tom i love you to death everyone's gonna love you kelly thank you i'm so excited and honored to be here man i appreciate it well i i appreciate you man tell them to uh were you uh, completely uh, uh, focused in and ready to go for an interview? Tell the truth. No, I hate interviews. I get all nervous. My hands are all sweating. It was so funny. I was watching uh, The Office with the, the family yesterday, and uh, they were at a business convention, and uh, one of them had to go up and give a speech, and he was literally frozen in his chair like this. <laughs> And I, that's that's basically how I felt about uh, five minutes ago. <laughs> well, I love it because most of us in the event that we had, you know, a lot, I think a lot of times people uh, stand behind what they have done. And that's the thing that I admire about you most is that you don't stand behind what you've done. You stand behind who you are. And that's a reason why I wanted to be able to have you on the podcast, I mean, and be able to connect with you. And I just told you from the beginning that I was going to force you to be my friend uh, for the rest of your life. Uh, I do want to pause uh, for a second for some station identification. This episode is brought to you by Piper Diamond Company, which is custom jewelry studio, the diamond source to all the stars, and Panerai. If you don't know about Panerai, you don't know anything about watches. With the right mix of art and science, strength and honor, and history and heroes, it's the perfect fusion between design and technology embodied in Panerai watches. So you're a part of that too, man. Um, so help us to understand who Tom Bachik is. I told you about some of the things you've done, but honestly, I like to throw that off to the side. But okay. let's talk about where Tom comes from, who you are, how you got doing this. Um, I, I literally got into the beauty industry by accident. Um, I went to school for graphic design with the idea of opening up my own airbrush studio. I got into airbrushing. I've, I've always liked to draw and paint. And so I got into airbrushing when I was in high school and I was like, this is amazing way to create depth and dimension. And, um, at the time I was, uh, you know, I would ride motorcycles and uh, my brother and I actually got a small local sponsor to race jet skis. And so the idea was, oh, we're gonna travel around the country and custom paint skis and helmets of the racers and, um, and basically, you know, live our life. Um, my wife and I found out we were getting ready to have our first child and uh, the whole starving artist living out of the back of a pickup, not really conducive for raising a family. And uh, we were having dinner with my cousin who was going to school to cut hair. My uncle actually is a hairdresser and uh, had his own product line and was friends with Paul Mitchell and was the president of a chain of beauty schools. And he told my cousin, you know, or my cousin was at school and my cousin told me, hey, you know, during times of recession, the, cause, okay, let me backtrack just a bit, sorry. Uh, my train of thought often jumps the tracks. My uh, my cousin was going to hair school. 
my wife and I were getting ready to have our child and um, we were getting a new, this was the early nineties. So we were getting ready to get a new president. Everybody was talking recession. And, and I was thinking also if people couldn't afford to buy the toys, the jet skis, the Harleys, the different things, how could they afford to get them customized? And uh, that's what my cousin said. Well, you know, during times of recession that the beauty industry actually increases uh, in revenue. And I, what? That's, well, that's cool, but I don't have, you know, a year and a half to go back to school for hair or makeup. And he was like, no, nails. I was like, nails? What do you know? I'm on my skateboard. I'm like, what are you talking about? Which also shows you kind of where I was, uh, you know, 23 years old on a skateboard. So um, it's time to get my life together. I had a family coming. And he said, no, simply. So nail art was starting to become a thing. And actually, I had seen that uh, ladies were getting their nails airbrushed. They were doing the full Hawaiian scenes. This was like early 90s when that was all the rage. Um, and all of a sudden, light bulbs started going off. I was like, well, instead of a studio, I could be in a salon. I could still set my hours. And this was so important for me because I wanted to, with, with a child on the way, I wanted to be able to make that time that, um, you know, being having my own business gave me the freedom to work as much as I want or take the time off when I want. So if my kids were at dance or playing sports, I could be there. Uh, and so that was really important to me. So that's why I w I've always been about, you know, owning my own business and, and doing my thing. Um, and then he was like, you know, simply change your canvas instead of, you know, take that airbrushing from the helmets and put it on the nails. And then I, I remembered that I had taught my mom's manicures how to airbrush nails. And it just all kind of made sense. And he said, you know, it's, it's 500 hours to get your license. So it was like four months of school. So this was something that was like quickly and easily attainable, as well as something that sounded amazing. And like, I just started to see all these different opportunities in that world that I never even paid attention to. So what I heard, and I want to go back to, is you were talking about you and your, you and your wife. I mean, you were, it was your girlfriend at the time, right? Um, was, were you guys married? We were actually married. So we got married at 20 years old. Whoa, 20 years old. Good Lord. Um, when did you meet? <laughs> we actually met in fifth grade. And we knew each other all through elementary, up through high school. And about our junior year in high school, we started hanging out as friends. We had different separate boyfriend, girlfriends. Uh, by the time our senior year, we were becoming best friends and we were just always hanging out. Let's go to the movies. Let's do this. Let's, hey, what are you doing tonight? Oh, let's watch it. Let's, you know, and just always hanging out. And then, um, it will, but it wasn't until the summer after our senior year that we actually officially started dating. So who approached who? Did you have game or did she have game? What was it, Tom? I want to say it was, it was her because I was kind of in my own world. I was build. I had a, an old 64 VW bug that I was kind of building from the ground up. And uh, she used to just come over and hang out in the garage and watch me work on the car. And we would just talk. Wow. That's incredible, man. So now, now how long have you been married now? 27 years, 27 years. So you're, are you just about to turn 40? <laughs> 49. You're about to be okay. 49. There we go. There we go. So 27 years of married. I want to, I want to congratulate you on that. It was amazing. Cause when you were at the BTC show and we were on the couch, a lot of people were throwing, not, I mean, not throwing things out, but they, you know, everyone wanted to know about the celebrities that they did or things like that. And you brought it back every time to your family. You brought it back to, you know, how you loved your wife, how you loved your family. And it was wrapped around, you know, you even said that you wanted to have a profession where you could be at dance, where you could be at sports, where you could be at those kind of things. So 27 years of marriage, dude, what is the secret? Because the listeners out there, obviously they want to know about your business, things like that. But there's people out there that are married. They're like, well, I'm struggling to make it through two years. How do we get to 27? <sighs> She's always right. <laughs> hey, Tom, did you do the good thing? You, I know you did. You married up. Am I correct? Yeah, for sure. For sure. I, I asked a guy the other day, I said, how do you stay married for, he has been married for like 50 years. He's like, marry up and then you'll always be grateful. You'll always so be grateful. if you take one lesson from this, that's what I would suggest. So <clears throat> you hop into it. You're, uh, we're, we're moving back to, you start, you say airbrushing and yeah. 
you just said it so nonchalantly and a matter of fact, like you get into a new business that you don't really know anything about. Take us through that too, because now you're, you're about to bring a different feel to it. Um, what happens? Where does Tom go right out of school? And you know, how does this journey start? Absolutely. So that was, our dinner was on a Thursday night on Friday night. I checked out the school and on Monday I started. So for me, my, my parents kind of raised me to, if you're going to do something, do it right. Do it, do it a hundred percent and, um, and be your best. You don't have to be the best, be your best. No one can ask anything more than that. So, uh, I've always, I've always kind of jumped on something and, and went in a hundred percent. Um, so I started school and when I was in school, the manicurist, we wore yellow smocks and all the hairdressers wore white smocks. And I just, I remember my first day at school and, and again, not knowing anything, I come in, uh, they're, they're starting the lecture. It's lecture time. Cause you know, the manicures rotate in and out. So uh, most of the hairdressers have been there for a year or whatnot, but we go in and we sit, I sit in the front and, uh, I remember, um, uh, one of the ladies, one of the hairdressers uh, walked up to me and they're like, oh, um, yellow. Yeah, you're a manicurist, so you have to sit in the back. And I said, why do I have to sit in the back? And she's like, because we're hairdressers and you're a manicurist. And I'm like, yeah, but I paid to be here just as you. So there's empty seats in the back. Go ahead. <laughs> and I stayed in the front because I'm like, no, I'm not moving. I, I paid to be here. And again, I was a punk skater and didn't care about anybody else anyhow. So I was like, rules, ha, there's no rules. Um, and at that moment I started learning that it felt like in the beauty industry, the manicurist was the, the, the stepchild to the beauty industry. It was kind of that add on behind. And so for me, from that point forward, I always wanted to make the manicuring or the nail world matter. I wanted to make it be something more than what it was at that time. Um, and so my goal was to be like <clears throat> the only manicurist you heard, and it wasn't even a manicurist. It was back in the day, there was these old Paul Mollive commercials where they, man, you're soaking in it. I'm like, that's like the most famous nail person there is. So, uh, my goal was like, okay, I'm going to beat that. Wow. So you go in, do you go into a salon? I mean, do you go into a, like a nail salon and start doing it? Um, you know, how are you? And, and also too, you're breaking stereotypes, right? So that's yeah. the thing that I love too, because most of the time, I mean, when I went into this, I, I got in in 93, right? Right. I went to hair school in 93. When did you go? What year? 93. Okay. So, and my parents raised me that I wasn't, that I didn't have to be the best, that I just had to be the best that I could possibly be. I believe our parents are connected. So 93, I go in, I get I mean, two quest or one question, one statement. One question is the obvious question that a boy going into the professional beauty industry gets. Number two was a statement. Oh, I figured that you couldn't do anything else. So you were going to go to hair school. Um, so how did you deal? Did you deal with those things? And how, if so, how did you deal with them? And how did your attitude, because like every time I've talked to you, Tom, it feels like I've known you for my whole life. And how has that played? How has your attitude played into it? Because it seems like you have a, you know, a, a glass half full kind of attitude. How has that helped you through your career too? Oh my gosh. So <clears throat> when I, when I was in school, um, not knowing anything about the industry, I started grabbing trade magazines. Um, you know, we started our classes and, and first of it was like, Hey, we're not, the first thing they, they taught us in school was that uh, we're here to teach you how to pass state board. You're gonna learn how to do nails when you get out in the real world. So it was like, oh my God, how, you know, I need to learn this. So I started grabbing trade magazines, nails, nail pro, um, uh, salon, uh, you name it. I was going through them all and I was just researching everything I could about nails. And what I found out is that they had nail competitions. And I was like, what? So there was trade shows and there was trade shows all over the world. And at these trade shows, there was hair and makeup and nail competitions. And I was like, wait, I can compete at doing nails. So I was like, oh, I'm not going to compete on a jet ski. Well, then I'm going to compete at doing nails. I'm like, you girls are going down. Um, but definitely uh, the stereotype of, because especially back then, there wasn't guys that were doing nails. The, the, um, 
the whole Asian nail salon uh, explosion hadn't happened yet. So it was literally, you know, basically day spas and salons. And, um, and so to have a guy doing nails was, it, it wasn't. Um, so definitely uh, there were moments where that was an issue, but then there was also moments where it was a positive. Like girls love to have a guy, you know, pampering them and holding their hands and, and you know, listening to them uh, in the salon. So there was, there was a lot of the times that, that it actually benefited me, I felt, for being a guy. Um, I started, so I started practicing. I started, uh, within the first month, the teacher had me actually teaching the acrylics class, how to do acrylics at school. And then I graduated school, hadn't received my license yet, so um, I was still considered a student for my first competition. And my first competition was the world competition at the time being held in Anaheim. And uh, for, it, was, it was a show called WINBA, World and Nail Beauty Association. And they used to hold it at, in Anaheim and people from all over the world, uh, Japan, Australia, the UK, uh, all over Europe would show up to compete in these different competitions. And, um, and so I went in as a student and uh, practice, practice, practice. That's the thing right there. Practice, practice, practice. Um, but went in and it was a timed competition and you had to uh, create a full set of nails. One hand had to be pink and white, so like a French manicure, but it had to be sculpted with acrylic. So all the smile lines, everything had to be exact same. One hand was polished and had to be the exact same. And they would literally judge, you know, the degree of C-curve on all 10 nails. Were they the same? Did they match from hand to hand? The degree of your arch was your apex, the highest point on the same place on every nail was the thickness of the nail from one side of the nail to the other the same from hand to hand? Was the white, because it was done with acrylic powder, was it still perfectly intensely white or did you file through it? Um, and so it was really just a lot about me at the time, I was learning all this stuff about consistency and design and what made a nail look elegant on the hands. Um, long story short, in the last 10 seconds of the competition, I decided to go back in and put another high shine because you couldn't use the top coat. You had to buff it to a high shine. And I literally broke the nail off and it just went out of that, out of that, out of that, so blank. And I was like, no. And I just like panicked. I have nine nails. What am I going to do? Uh, I just got disqualified and I felt so bad because my, my model, you know, she had been practicing with me for weeks. Um, I felt like I let everyone down because we drove, you know, from out of town to get there and whatever. So I'm like, you know what? It doesn't matter. Let's go and let's get judged. Because even though we're, we only have nine nails and we're disqualified, um, so I didn't, because I didn't even clock out or anything. I'm like, go get judged. Let's hear what the judges have to say. Let's turn this into a learning experience, okay? What do we need to do different? Um, let the judges, because as my first competition, I had no idea what, again, what, what am I doing? So we go and get judged. We decide to hang out because we're like, you know what? We need to support the other competitors. We're all in this together. So we stay for the award show. And um, they call fifth, fourth, third, second. And they called my name for second place. And I was like, second place? I didn't clock out and I only have nine nails. And I was like, oh my God, we got second place. We got second place. So we went up, I got my trophy. And then the judges came up to me afterwards and they're like, why didn't you clock out? They said, you tied for first place with nine nails. All your other nails scored so high, it still tied you for first place. And you would have won had you had clocked out and we could have measured that. And I was like, I don't care. This is, this is a first place win for me. I was just so excited and blown away. And then, and then the rest was history. Like I, I was into competition. I was into making my nails better. Uh, so it, it literally started because of nail art. But then it transformed into if the nail itself didn't look good, how was the art going to look good on top of it? And so then I, I stepped back and started really focusing on, on uh, my nails themselves. So help me with this. I'm going to take you back in time because, you know, hearing this is, is so incredible. The thing that sticks out to me, too, is a lot of people in that situation would just lose their stuff. They would lose their stuff. 
Um, you talked about a couple of things. Number one is when you were saying it, hey, this thing fl- fell off. But as you were saying, I don't know the words that you said. You said, blah, 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 boom or whatever. When, <laughs> when you did, you were smiling the whole time. And then you said, wow, let's go back and support all the other people. Where does that mentality come from? Do you think it's born in or were you taught that? And who were you taught that by? Well, you know what? I actually, I grew up in playing sports. Um, and I think that was probably part of the mentality that, you know, um, whether you win or lose, you, you cheer on the other team, you're all in this together. Um, and it's, it's, I don't know. I just always felt like put myself in their shoes and, you know, if, if someone doesn't win and then they take off and they're not part of the, the, you know, the closing ceremonies or whatever, it doesn't show good sportsmanship. It doesn't show um, you know, being part of, of building the whole show, the whole thing, making it, making it what it, it could be. I don't, I can't find the right words, but you did find the right words. How, how has this been able to help you too, with your children? You got three beautiful children. Uh, you got Brennan 23 gauge 26. Am I correct? And then, uh, Zoe is, uh, 21. Um, and also who do you love the most? <laughs> uh, my wife. my kids ask me that all the time i remember when my daughter uh my son was born when my daughter was like two and a half three years old and people would be like who do you like more and i would be like my daughter because i've known her longer um (laughs) i but i I tell you it's a it's a tough one but they always try and get you that way i was always trying to get you my my kids do it with their grandparents grandma who's your favorite Yes. Who's yeah. your favorite? You got you got the little girl though. I mean, so with Zoe, and she Zoe's killing it too. She's a choreographer. She's done work done work with Derek Huff, uh, TLC. Um, she's a gangster on TikTok. Uh, I heard. Um, but how? Ha- because I'm seeing the success in all of your in, in your children, your offspring. Seeing the success in your uh, you know in your marriage, those kind of things. Do you carry that type of attitude? I mean, because you seem to, honestly, you have the sunny side up attitude. Did it come even before sports? And I mean, do you think that, I mean, where was, where was some of the conditioning? And if so, could you give us an example of like, maybe when your dad, like, I don't know if your dad did this, but my dad had like three sayings and he said them all the time. He said, breathe, drink water and pray. And as long as you do those things, life will be okay. And I'm like, yeah, whatever, dad, you're just dead. Did your dad have those kind of things or your mom have? Um, I think that um, my, my dad was always, he, he would do the, the sports things about, you know, uh, you give it your all, you play till the end, you never give up. Um, my mom was, uh, was definitely the, um, the God is with you. You'll get through this. Uh, it doesn't say, you know, when you die in the, the, the valley of death, it says, as you pass through the valley of death. So, yeah, so I think that, um, and that, you know, as things happen and as problems happen, it's, it's always, you, you, you kind of get, I mean, we're people, we get to make the choice. Um, we, we don't get to choose what happens to us, obviously, and I know this is cliche, but we get to choose how we respond to what happens to us. Um, and knowing that, Every time I get grumpy, you know, my kids will come to me and be like, well, you could choose to be grumpy, dad, or you could choose to let's go outside and do something. And I'm like, oh, why did I ever tell him that? <laughs> so what age, Tom, what age did you start understanding and knowing that your parents were right? It took me probably till about, I would say probably 23, 20, uh, 23, 25, until I started to realize the things that my dad said and my mom said was right. Otherwise I was like, they're just dead. Like I just, uh, Brennan was just helping us set up. And I was like, do you know that your dad is as cool as what he is? And he was like, he's just my dad. You know, what age was it that you really started to listen to your parents? No, it's so funny. Um, I don't know if I, if I actually have started uh, to listen to him. I'm just joking. (laughs) I don't know if I actually have a a time of when I remember uh, when I remember um, having that attitude from from a young age of always um there was no limits we could do what we wanted to do and so you know um what's going to set me apart from someone else it's it's one the attitude of of knowing you can do it but then also the work like i might not be as good as someone but i'm going to outwork them 
to get the result that I want. So like I grew up playing soccer, well, baseball first, but then I got into soccer. Um, and uh, my first soccer coach was an ex pro from the UK. And so we would be doing laps around the field and I would try to lap people. So my goal was like, okay, if I'm going to be out here, then how can I, how can it make me better? How can I uh, push it to, to be better? And so then I think that that mentality, you know, carries over, help carry over. I think when, uh, you know, into my job and my career and in anything that I do, but I think it's that um, I was probably, it probably wasn't until after I had kids that I found myself repeating, you know, what my parents would say. And that's when I was like, oh my gosh, I sound like my dad. Because I said so. <laughs> now, I mean, you're, you're, uh, if I could tell you this, I'm, I'm sure that your wife is super hot, but you're a great looking guy. And maybe that's uh, going to make you, uh, hopefully it doesn't make you feel weird. Um, but you're a, a, a great looking dude. Did you get your looks from your mom or your pop? Uh, I look, I look like both, but a little bit more on my mom's side. Okay. All right. So your mom is beautiful. I, um, yeah. yeah. So help me with this too, because my, my brother, um, who is here in the studio, uh, he, he makes me mad. He's good at everything. Like he's good at everything naturally. Like he, I mean, he locked himself in his room and learned how to do production. Now he's on top level working with major brands. He uh, has his own red camera. Um, I mean, the kid is, I mean, he's, I want to say kid, he's not a kid, but he's ridiculous. What he attributes a lot of his success to is skateboarding when he was a kid. And he still skateboards to this day. And, and when he told me this, I, I was like, okay, well, how does skateboarding relate? What he told me was he would be out and he would try a trick sometimes 100, 200 times and only land it once. And what he told me is taking that mentality into business and into life, he was okay with failing because he failed 200 times. He did it one time and he was super excited about it. How, how has skateboarding played a role, if, if any, um, in, that, in that part? Because I feel that there's so many kids out there are scared to fail. And I watch skateboarders and literally, like I watch them for three hours and they don't land it. And then they maybe land it once and they tell all their friends. So has that helped you? Absolutely. Um, it's funny, I started skateboarding probably when I was about seven, uh, six or seven, my parents bought me like one of those little plastic banana boards. Um, so that would have been like in 76. And, um, uh, and I just remember getting it and we started competitions right then. We would take two of like those little five gallon buckets and we'd put a broomstick across it and we'd practice jumping over the broomstick and we'd raise it like just crazy stuff. But exactly that you do it over and over and over and over. Um, and, and, bloody knees, elbows, palms. And, um, but that was kind of the fun of it. Like failing wasn't, uh, it, it wasn't a deterrent. Like, it's so crazy that now we have to tell people like you should fail over and over and over because that's how you learn. You don't learn so much from success. You just like, yeah, cool. I did it. But it's unless you failed over and over and over that that success becomes so special and, and, uh, so appreciated. Well, I love this because I'm going to fast forward now. Um, I'm going to fast forward to present day. Um, you've been, you, I, I love these, these plays on words. Uh, you've been known as the Manny man in, uh, in Hollywood, Hollywood's man. Manny curist. Right. Uh, and then, uh, one of them that I read was the, um, the manicurist to the hoity toity. And then you just put the little LOL after it, which I loved. I'm telling you every single, for those of you listening, every single person in Hollywood, any woman that you see on a magazine, any woman that you see on TV, Tom is the man behind the nails. And you can imagine, can you imagine if a woman was in an ad and she had some crunchy looking nails? I tell this to one of, one of the hairdressers told me this, um, how important nails were to hairdressers because when you cut someone's bangs, your nails are literally right in their face. And a lot of young kids that get into the business, they don't take care of those things. So I'm going to, we want to fast forward to Hollywood's Manny man and the Manny curist, right? So you're in that part, but I want to tell you a story that's on a, a very lower, a, a lot lower level, right? So my wife is a national educator for Paul Mitchell and she's the, she does all the training for all the trainers. So throughout the world, all the trainers come and my wife trains them. 
And my wife got a chance to do hair, uh, hair for the Golden Globes just recently. It was actually, I, I text you when I was up there. And um, Tom happened to be in a different hotel, guys. Uh, we, we were like at the Holiday Inn. Um, you know, Tom was, you know, with the, with the, with the elite. But um, one of the girls in our company, when they found out, uh, she's about 21 years old, she, or 20 years old at the time, she found out that my wife was going to do hair for the Golden Globes, and she freaked out. She's like, how did you get to do that? That's so amazing. How did you get to do that? My wife said, well, I've had a relationship with Paul Mitchell for about 17 years. I've done a ton of shows. I have great friends within it. I've constantly just been around, and you know what? They called me. And she's like, yeah, yeah, that, I, I understand all that stuff, but how did you get to do the Golden Globes? And she was like, because of 17 years, because of this, because of that. And the girl was like, no, no, no. I'm not asking about all those relationships. I'm asking, how did you do the Golden Globes? And my, my wife didn't even answer the question. She just walked away. So help our audience because everyone out there is going to be like, oh my gosh, I want to do nails now because I want to do JLo's nails. Walk us through this. We're in present day. You're the most sought after. You're the only nail artist in the history of the industry to get sponsored by Chanel. The first one, you're on every major magazine. You're with every star, everything like that. Let's talk about the present. Okay. Um, I, I, I heard it said it only takes 20 years to become an overnight success. And I, and I, so it's, it's exactly what Brooklyn was saying that it was, it's about building time. It's about the relationships. It's about consistency. Um, so many times you hear about someone who comes in and they rise to the top out of nowhere because somebody happened to know someone who got them in and something happened. But you also then hear that they were the first to crash and they didn't last very long. Um, I think I think that um, getting to where I am takes time. You, you can't do it without it. I mean, it takes a lot of things, um, but. Um, one, you have to be good at what you do. And that comes from 20 years experience because it's not just about the actual, um, the nail itself, but it's, it's how you interact with the celebrity. It's how you interact with the other members of the glam team. It's how you interact in the situations, whether it's on set, a red carpet, uh, the Super Bowl. It's, it's being, being part of that whole team and how you all work together to, uh, support and help build up that celebrity who, who, um, you know, who's looking towards her team to be there for her or him, uh, in those crazy stressful situations, they depend on us to be there to, to help, you know, create that confidence and that look and that, uh, that feel of, I can do this. Let's get out there and, uh, bust out this halftime show. So, I mean, he's, he's referring, guys, to the Super Bowl. He, he, Tom was at the Super Bowl this year because J-Lo, everybody saw J-Lo and Shakira. And, um, you know, at the Golden Globes, too, you were there You were there with, uh, was it Adir or were you were there with Chris Appleton? Um, I was there actually with um, uh, Bryce and Patty. We were doing uh, Margot Robbie. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what, take us through this, too, because what you just said, you said, you know, it takes a lot of things. I mean, it takes time. It takes. But take us through some of those things, because I think in today's society, right, in an in a insta famous kind of uh, place, there's so many kids that think, well, I'm gonna, my next post is really going to take me to that next crazy place. And I don't really have to do anything. I just got to create content. And I, what I loved about you when I first met you is you weren't about creating content. You were about creating relationships and the content was built in the background. Absolutely. Absolutely. That that's great insight. Um, I think, well, for instance, so, um, I was on a video shoot this week or <laughs> not this week. It was about three weeks ago before everything went crazy. Um, I was on a video shoot and, um, and some of the friends of the people on the video shoot, we were just talking about, what's happening with social media and about their friends who were in at the beginning of like the YouTubers and the first influencers. And now, and it was, it was about the content, what they were creating and everybody was eating it up and they had to have it in the influencers with the new, uh, advertising and blah, blah, blah. And then now that's all starting to change. It's starting to focus more on micro influencers and YouTube 
is, is turning more towards TikTok. Not that YouTube will go anywhere, but you know, just people's attentions change over time. And now there's a whole new group of influencers um, that people are starting to look to and follow and be part of. And then these people who were huge and, and big in their platforms are now uh, not knowing what to do. Like how, oh my gosh, why didn't I switch to that? And now they're losing followers and the followers are switching. And there was no relationships. There's nothing here except for the content they were creating. But now people's focus isn't as much on that content. And so again, that's where I think, you know, people want to be famous. Like, how do I be famous? But where does famous get you in the long run? Like, it's it's a quick fleeting moment. And then, and then what? Um, you know, it's your 15 seconds and then someone else is famous. Um, I think that's something too that I've always kept in, in the back of my mind. My, my parents taught me was that, um, there's always going to be someone better than you. There's always going to be someone that you're better than. And that's why you always want to do your best. Um, and, and like everything ebbs and flows, right? Uh, the tide comes in and goes out. There's going to be times where you're super well-known and famous um, or great at what you do. And then that's going to go away. But what are you doing during those times to get back in for when it, it flows back? So it's always constantly... Uh, working your hardest to do your best, but things will naturally change. And you have to be ready to, during those times, uh, set yourself up for when it changes back towards your direction. Um, and, and again, that, that's going to that's gonna come with time. So one is I, I focus on my skills. Uh, I, I try to make sure that I do a great job. Um, and in fact, sometimes I have to like step back because I'll, I'll get too myopic and they'll be like, it looks good enough. We got to go. We got to go. I'm like, okay, okay. Um, so uh, what was that we talked about before the smelly kid for, for being too slow because I get too myopic and I focus too much and it's like, they're good enough. Okay. Um, but it, I believe in excellence, do your best. So I, I try to always do my best. And uh, um, um, so doing my best. So always working on my skills. Um, the, one of the big things in my world is, is, a, is, is trust. So your clients have to trust you. I mean, I'm doing nails, you know, in their kitchen, in their living room, during a meeting. Um, you know, they're on the phones with doctors, uh, lawyers, business things. This is happening. Talking about scripts, music videos, working on things. Um, and they have to have trust. They have to know that, you know, you're part of, part of the family and that uh, it's not about, uh, they're not worried about me leaking anything out or just, you know, getting content out. Look, I was with, and we did this. Um, it's not about that. So most of the really cool and fun stuff, like no one will ever even know because it, it was, it was their moment. It's theirs. It's not me. I'm just in there doing my job. Um, and so I don't feel that it's, it's right for me to go and talk about it or do anything about it or try to gain off of it. If that makes any sense. It does make a lot of sense. I was just, I was actually just listening to Gary V yesterday or uh, two days ago. And what he was saying is if you can hold off on the ask for as long as possible, those are the people who win. Because I find that exactly what you were talking about, like I think that so many kids are, are you know, and so many kids and young people or just young people in our industry, they go and they do stuff and then they want the picture or they want the video and they want to post it. But I, um, I want to, I want to, well, I'm going to come back to this question. I'm going to come back to that question, but I want to go to this one uh, because I want uh, to understand it. My friend, Tim Story, phenomenal guy. If you don't know him, um, he's a pastor that's close to you, um, but he's incredible. And what he said is that your big break is made up of a bunch of little breaks. So take us through Tom's little breaks that got, because I mean, we were, you just threw out the Super Bowl and you're like, yeah, I was at the Super Bowl. And, da, da, da. and then, oh, I was at the Golden Globes da, 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 with Margot Robbie. Da, 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 da. Right. So obviously it didn't start with J-Lo. Um, it didn't start with Margot Robbie. It didn't start with Anne Hathaway, Claire Danes, and you name the whole thing. Except the only thing that my, my son is going to hear, my son is eight, and he is going to now know that daddy is friends with Black Widow's friend. Hey. Right? So... Take us through the little breaks. So the little breaks for me were probably first realizing and seeing the opportunities in the beauty industry. 
um, and taking that step and being open to, um, you know, there was also a lot of prayer involved. God, what am I going to do? I'm going to be a dad. I need to grow up. Show me the way. Um, and, and there was just something that when my, when my cousin said beauty school, it made no sense, but in my heart, I knew that's what it was. I'm like, that's where I'm supposed to go. Um, so starting school, then the nail competitions, that first competition winning, uh, tying for first, my, uh, second competition was in the professional world and I took second in professional. My third competition was that same year, the world competition that I did my student. And I won the world competition within one year of having my license. So then I got approached by all these different manufacturers. Um, I took a position with Creative Nail Design, uh, which had just been purchased by Revlon because I thought, okay, how do I continue to grow where I'm going with this? Um, and I became like Brooklyn, I became their trainer of trainers. I became their global artistic director and they would fly me around the world to train our distributors, educators, how to teach people to use the products. Um, in the meantime, I was also developing products for them. And, but the big break was I started doing the nails for their photo shoots. And when I did that, I met a famous makeup artist, Francesca, who was Beyonce's makeup artist. And she's like, wow, we were, do we were collaborating on some avant-garde looks and she was like doing leopard print eyes and I was doing leopard print nails to match. And she's like, your work's amazing. Who's your agent? Agent? What? You can get an agent to do nails? Okay, I'm from LA, but you guys are way too LA for me. Like, there's an agent? And she's like, yeah, how did you get the job? I'm like, oh, I worked for the company. She's like, no, you need to work for my agent. So that's how I got into doing celebrities. Um, so Beyonce, so Tom, Beyonce is on the list too? Yeah, Beyonce is on the list. Can you say to Bobby, his name is Bobby Bosch. Bobby Bosch is going to lose his stuff. None of you guys know who Bobby Bosch is, but he's the director of our Chicago location. This guy is salt to the earth. Absolutely amazing. Can you look into the screen and say, Bobby, I did Beyonce's nails. Bobby, I did Beyonce's nails. I did her nails for all of her uh, Queen Bee videos. Oh my gosh. Okay. So go back to it. So now you got your, we're, we're in the agent. Yeah. And of course the agent's like a guy that does nails. Eh, we already have four people. We don't need you. And I was like, okay. And then the makeup artist, Francesca's like, oh no. So she calls the agency back and basically says, you have to take him. So they're like, okay, Francesca says we have to take you. So we'll bring you on, but we're just going to throw you piecework. And I was like, yeah, totally. Cause I was, you know, I had a job, I was working for the manufacturer. So that was totally fine. Um, wait a second. So I went from school to competition, but I also worked in the salon for on and off for five years while transitioning into, uh, to the work. So, um, that was, that was still a big part of it because that's where you really learn relationships. And the greatest thing that I, I loved about the salon was, uh, being involved in people's lives and watching them grow and change. Like, how, how many times do, and, and how many jobs do you actually get to be in a profession where you grow with the people around you and you, you know, you watch their middle school or graduate high school and, you know, people have babies and, uh, and, and get to actually make a difference in how they feel each day. So that to me was like a big, a big step. Um, working for the manufacturer, working for a CMD agency, then my first big job was um britney spears for the cover of rolling stone with a famous photographer um and i was like okay cool so um did that and i and i you know what i've never been a person to be starstruck either like you know i'm i'm excited to work with someone but we're all people you know and, and i think what you said earlier was it's not it's not what we do but it's who we are it's not all the things that i've done but it's who am i as a person and what is the things that I'm doing? Who does that make me as a person? Who am I becoming? Um, and, and that's the thing is always striving to become better than I was the day before. Um, so, but I, I will tell you, I was super excited because I was like a big Britney fan. So I was like, kind of like awe and starstruck and I was like kind of googly and um, started doing her nails. And then, you know, she wiped her wet polish through her hair. And I was like, okay. So then I fixed it and then she smudged it again across her, her smock while they were doing her hair. I was like, okay. And after about the third time, I realized we're all just people. 
Like, you know, I had this, oh my God, this is so amazing. It's Britney Spears. I don't know. And then it's like, no, she's a 19 year old girl. And okay, I get it. You know, she's Britney Spears. And then Britney Spears are, are almost two different people. You have like Britney Spears, the, uh, or this, I should say, and, and not even using Britney as a, an example, but, but um, uh, the celebrity, you know, at home in their sweats with their kids. And then you have the celebrity out on stage at the Super Bowl. It's, 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 it's their job. It's, it's who they, you know, are at work, but who they are as people are just people. Um, and so that's, I think that's part of the reason why I, I've learned not to be so starstruck because at the end of the day, she was, she was, she was an 18 year old girl and she was on the phone with her friends and she wasn't thinking and she was having fun and we're doing this photo shoot. And so, and I'm only worried about the nails. So of course, any little thing on the nails, I'm like, ah, what? Ah, ah. and then it's like, relax. Like what if, if this is my daughter, how would you be? You'd just be like, okay, give me your hands. Let's fix this. Da, da, da. And, uh, and end up having a great shoot and so much fun. But from that, it went to, you know, doing Eva Longoria and then uh, come to find out. So another major moment was when Victoria Beckham uh, came to town, moved to LA. So that was on a Thursday or a Friday. And my brother calls and is like, Tom, dude, Tom, David and Victoria just moved to LA. And she said she needs three things. She needs to find a school for her kids, um, a manicurist and then a house. And I was, and he's like, you got to do her nails. I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm just going to like, how am I going to do Victoria's nails? So that was Friday night. Saturday, I get a call from Eva Longoria. Hey, Tom, I got a friend who needs her nails done. She wears acrylics and I don't trust anyone but you with acrylics. And so I'm like, oh man, you know, Eva, I'm, I'm not working this weekend. Da, da, da. Cause I was like, I don't want to go into town and do someone's friend. <laughs> and being lazy you know I was like uh I just had a long week and then all of a sudden I was like wait does this friend happen to have an accent and she's like maybe I'm like yeah I'm available so literally the day after Victoria got into town I started doing her nails and I've done her nails in LA when she's in LA ever since um but the the best part was where I got starstruck is when I first met David because I'm a huge, I played soccer my whole life. So when David showed up, I was like, dude, <clears throat> what's up? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing nails. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> I had to be manly. Um, so, so that was, that was pretty funny. So, so the agency, um, sorry, I get my total train of thought just totally goes off the tracks because I've got so much. Uh, so then, so the big things would then be the agency. And then, um, I did a couple of, uh, of product lines that didn't work out so much in my benefit as it did the people that I did them with, uh, but lessons well learned. And, um, and then I, I got to, I got to be the first manicurist because of, so, okay. So the reason I say that is because, because of that, um, I didn't have a job other than the agency now at this point, because the product line did, was it didn't work out as, as intended. Um, which, Again, things that are beyond your control, you can't worry about. You can fret about it and you can cry and be like, oh, why didn't this happen? And why didn't I get that? And I gave all this and I did all this. And at the end of the day, when someone, you know, comes to you and says, you know, shakes your hand, says, we don't need you anymore. You're probably better with a bigger company. You just, well, what can you do? But all you can say is there's, there's, a, there's a bigger picture. There's a reason. And one, we'll get through this. Two, who am I becoming when I get through this? And because there's definitely a reason, like we, we don't go through things for nothing. And, um, and maybe it's just a shift in the direction that I was going, that I wasn't going in the right direction and I needed a shift. Well, because the business went bad, I had to focus on the agency and I was doing every job, every, and, and trust me to do nails for a magazine cover, it's a hundred bucks. So I was making like a hundred bucks a day but I was in LA every day, every day, every day. And I was, I had the covers of, you know, seven, eight magazines out at one time. I had fashion shoots. So I was doing everything. And because of that and, and barely making enough, you know, to keep the lights on food in the kitchen. But because of that, Chanel said, man, your name's everywhere. We're seeing you everywhere. You're on the covers of this, blah, blah, blah. And we have a team that actually puts this together where your name's at in the magazine da, 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 and it creates a valued scale and they're like you're off the charts and we would love to to work with you 
And that's how I got the job with Chanel. So that business going bad put me in the position to become that first manicurist to have a contract with Chanel. Wow. So uh, tell me quickly, too, because I think that everyone seems to, I mean, you're, yeah, dude, I, I, I have to go back to probably David Beckham when he rolled in. He was like, damn, someone's as handsome as me in the place. Um, but I mean, you're an incredible man. You got a phenomenal heart. You got a great family. Um, you got a great outlook. A lot of people are like, uh, oh, he's just, I mean, he's the anomaly. Let's, let's toss him out with the bathwater. You know what I'm saying? Um, what, tell us about a failure. Tell us about an epic failure that you've had. Like one of those, like, oh my gosh, like I was telling you before we started, I just, uh, interviewed one of the top people in our industry and I didn't push record. Um, <laughs> all my fault. I suck. Um, I've had, uh, you know, a bunch of things like that. Tell us, uh, tell us quickly about something that you failed on that you were like, Oh my goodness. You know what? There's, there's, uh, there's, there's been a lot of failures and, and you just gotta, you, you roll with them. But it, you know, it's funny cause when I, when I say failure, I think of something that I learned from, from Robert Cromings and that was, there's no such thing as uh, failures, just discoveries. And, um, uh, cause Kelly, I like, I've known of you and Robert and the team since when I was with creative and I would do the platform, uh, at the shows, we would follow you guys a lot of the times. And I would go and watch your guys' show because you guys were so innovative and new and fresh to an industry that was, I felt still like there was, there wasn't, there wasn't what you guys were giving. Uh, out there. And so I would watch what you guys would do and I would see the way you guys would act on stage and how you would dress and your attitude and, and, and what you guys would talk about. And then I would take that and I would take it back to C and D and I'd be like, this is what we need to be doing for our stage presentation. Like I shouldn't be sitting at a nail table with a camera over my shoulder saying, press here, do this, da, da, da. I should be standing up and I should be able to talk and the camera should be over my pedest my, my, my pedestal and I should be able to go back and forth and work and talk. And so we, it literally changed how we did our main stage performance, how, how I thought about and the ideas that I brought into rewriting our education, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I've just got to say like, uh, I'm also a big fan, um, <laughs> for sure, for sure. Um, so now I totally forgot the question you just asked me. Oh, failures, failures. Give me some that Tom, Tom, Tommy terrific. You're the new Tommy terrific. Um, but the Tommy terrific, tell us when, when you, when you goofed it up, like what, what is, where is it at? Yeah. So one that stands out is, um, we, I was working with JLo, Jennifer, and she went away on tour. So she was gone uh, a few months and we started with her nails fairly short because she, she does a lot of performing on stage. But while she was gone, I, I connected her with a couple different manicures, like, over in Europe and stuff so she could keep her nails up to up while on tour. But when she came back, her nails were really long and, um, and they were pretty grown out. And so we, you know, it's, it's one of those late night chocolate chip, milk and cookies, watching TV things. Um, and I'm doing her nails and I'm like, okay, so what do we want to do with the length? Do you want to take these back down? And in my head, I'm thinking, take it back down to when we started the tour. And she's like, she's looking at them and she's like, She's like, yeah, I love that they've grown so long, but let's take them back to where they were. And she just meant the little bit that had grown out. And so I hear, but as guys typically do, I wasn't listening. <laughs> and I literally took her nails, like literally, probably half the length of what they were. Just took them all off. Boom, 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 cut them down. Choo, 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 with, the, with a, a clipper. And she's like talking to, and she just stops and she looks down and she's like, what did you do? And I'm like, what do you mean? You said, take them back to where we started. And she's like, no, no, just to where they had grown out. I just spent three months growing those nails out. And then I was like, oh my gosh. So I was just looking at her smiling. I'm like, la, la, la. <laughs> and I'm like, sorry, I, I, I heard you, but I guess I wasn't less. And we had a, we just had a huge laugh over it. And then of course, the, you know, the next few events she had to always tell everybody. And then Tom cut all my nails off and we had to start from scratch. 
I so it. um i love i love you're the, you're seriously in my life you're the new tommy terrific i love tom how you were just how you were just like oh yeah i was having milk and cookies uh with j-lo <laughs> it's one of those milk and cookie nights none of us listening are like yeah i know that kind of milk and cookie night i had one last night with my kids but not with j-lo <laughs> So let's, let, let's shift into this as, uh, uh, you know, and what I want to know is, I mean, obviously Tom, who's humble, who's a great husband, phenomenal father, um, incredible family man, great businessman, the best in the industry. What's next? Um, that's a great question because I feel like our whole world is changing and, um, some of the ideas of where, I thought we're going to be cool and important. I'm not so sure. Like, I don't know. Like, I feel like, cause I was looking at, you know, what is my far, far away thing. And in, in the past, it's always been about, you know, I'm going to have, I'm going to be the, you know, the most famous manicurist and I'm going to be the biggest well-known name, or I'm going to have the biggest product line. And I, I I'm not so sure that, that's as important to me anymore. Like when you look at everything going on in the world and you realize that being with like, even though we're stuck at home, getting to spend this time with my family is a blessing. So yes, I know it's scary and there's crazy stuff happening, but I still see all the positive things like, shoot, I would be gone all over the place and not spending time with my family. And I'm getting to do so much catch up with my kids and my wife that I wouldn't get to do. Takes a little bit of learning because, <laughs> you know, they're, 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 my family's like, oh, don't you have to go to work today? Oh, great, you can't. Oh. So they're stuck with me. But, um, but yeah, so I think um, just literally in, in the last few weeks, well, and, and probably a little bit before that, like I've been reevaluating just my life, where I want to take it, what I want to do with it. And, um, and, I think that I believe that doing nails honestly was uh, a gift for God to put me in the places that I need to be because people ask what, like you said, that 20 year old kid, how do, how do I do what you do? How do I do what you do? And, and I try to tell him, I'm like, um, well, okay. So for instance, at the behind the chair show, um, Chris Appleton and I are friends of course. And, um, and he's got a big following and everyone's like, Oh, I want to work for Chris Appleton. I want to work for Chris Appleton. So I'm like, so, you know, we laugh about it, but then at the show, a couple of people are like, Oh my God, Tom Baycheck. Hey, how's it going? Da, da, da. And then they're like, you work with Chris Appleton, right? I was like, oh, okay, I see where this is going. And then they're like, uh, how can I work with Chris Appleton? And then, so I always just, I try to flip it around. I'm going to be, and I say, okay, well like, you know, how long have you been working? Oh, I just started. Da, da, da. And I'm like, okay. And you want to do celebrity hair and you want to work or you want to, I said, you know, what are you doing to make Chris Appleton want to work with you? Yeah. Who, who are you becoming? What skills do you have that Chris is going to say, I need that in my team to make my job easier, better, bigger, stronger. Um, and I'm like, work on that. Make, who are you becoming? What are you doing so that Chris wants to work with you? And so, and I feel the same thing. It, for someone who wants to work with anyone, what are they doing so that those people want to work with them? Um, and so I think that's, that's some of the advice that I like to give. The, the gangster Tommy Turvick just came out. The gangster is like, <laughs> what are you doing right now, brother? Like, and I, we hear it, honestly, we hear it all the time. Um, I've been really um, uh, excited about music lately and uh one of the songs that just came up it's by the far side i don't know i mean that's our our generation but i don't know if you're a hip-hop guy uh but there was a song on a lab cabin california it's called uh gotta kick something that means something and that's the whole um the the chorus so as we go um as we finish up today um I've, well before we do that let's uh how can they get a hold of you how can they uh, follow you where is it what's the what's the handles facebook tiktok all those things let's get them in there absolutely at tom baycheck on all of them okay at tom t-o-m baycheck b-a-c-h-i-k awesome or you could just look under tommy terrific and it's going to show up golden horseshoe rainbow and it'll, he'll be at the end of the rainbow with the pot of gold um so 
uh, that, that song has been huge in my brain and in my heart. It got to kick something that means something. And when this whole thing happened, when the world started to change, I started to, uh, realize I was talking with my brother yesterday that, um, for my, when I first started my career, I didn't get in the career for money. I got in it because I loved it and I just wanted to do it. As we go along, money comes involved. We all know that. Um, we have families. We got to do that stuff. And this kind of reset or reboot, as we're talking about it, has really got me to the point where I, I want to kick something that means something. So what is the something that means something to you? And what is the message about attitude that you would give to all of our listeners out there, Tom? Well, I, I'm with you 100% and that it, it's 98% of it is attitude um, because you can overcome anything if you have the right attitude. It doesn't matter what you're going through. You, if, if you choose to be happy, if you choose to, to take advantage of whatever it is, um, you'll get through it. And, and it's hard. Like it's, you know, we all go through times where everything is, is scary, but you have to have faith that God is with you. He's going to go with you through the trials and, uh, and, and you're going to come out a better person. It's just the, it's just the way it is. I love this. Tom, I could stay on. You, you promised me that we'll do a second episode, but we'll do it here in studio. We'll do it together. Uh, we'll be able to hang out. I got a couple of surprise guests that I'll bring in for you too. Um, but from a guy who came from a very small town in Downey and Garden Grove, uh, you know, spent time at Tehachapi, uh, you know, met his, his wife now 27 years in fifth grade, um, became a, a, a manicurist when it wasn't popular, um, you know, won competitions. Uh, does celebrity hair, travels all over the country, does the, uh, the magazines, all those things, and happens to have milk and cookies with J-Lo while he's doing her hair. Um, the message that I want to get out about this guy is, is who he is and who his heart is and how tremendous of a man. And our conversations on the phone or through uh, uh, Instagram or anything like that, you are just a gentleman. You are an incredible man. You're an example of what guys, I believe, and men should be. And I want to thank you for your time. Um, thank you for listening to the Kelly Cardenas podcast. Uh, share it with your friends. Hide your mom. Hide your wife. Because we're coming for you, baby. <laughs>